Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to get us started. Uh, P.J. Crowley, our featured speech speaker, is en route from the Department of State. So if traffic is as traffic is, presumably he will get here in just the next few minutes. I'm Frank Sesno. I am the director of the School of Media and uh, Public Affairs. Um, I am also a, a refugee and uh, in the growing ranks of refugees from CNN. Uh, so I have had a great deal of experience dealing with uh, global media and uh, global reporting. And so we welcome uh, to the School of Media and Public Affairs and the George Washington University today our uh, journalists from other ports of call who now uh, call Washington home and who are reporting from the Capitol here. Uh, the discussion today is co-sponsored by the Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, Transat Transatlantic Media Network and by our own uh, Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication. And uh, we share a, a commitment to uh, the issues sort of embodied in our names in terms of uh, networking and communication. Uh, and we're very, uh, very pleased to have you here today. And we really look forward to a terrific panel discussion and, of course, a terrific uh, conversation uh, with PJ. What PJ will do when he comes here is he'll speak for uh, a few minutes uh, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, may I just ask by a show of hands, how many um, um, journalists do we have who are posted to Washington from other par parts around the world? So a few here, side, sides, okay, thank you very much. We know we had several uh, RSVPs and I see some people outside so we'll presumably be added, uh, joined by some more. And students here at uh, GW, how many have we got? Terrific. The um, conversation today is called Navigating the U.S. Media. Um, I think two words are, are very, a very good place to start. Good luck. Uh, navigating the U.S. Media is becoming an increasingly difficult, challenging, and at times dangerous task. I have heard from more than one uh, journalist based here in Washington who laments at going all across the Capitol and finding the great stories only to find that they're editors or producers or those who are assigning them back in Paris or Rome or, uh, uh, or, or Tokyo are watching CNN International or Sky or some other place and finding the scandal du jour in Washington and reassigning them based on what they're watching as opposed to uh, what is actually happening or being recommended from, uh, right from here uh, at, at the, at the uh, News Organizations Bureau. Um, I can also tell you, and I think, and I hope PJ will talk to you about this, for those who are trying to cover Washington as a city and as a functioning, leaving, living, breathing national capital and global capital, that what you hear from different podiums at different agencies and in different buildings is very, very much subject to that building's peculiar culture. In my years covering CNN at the uh, covering for CNN, the White House, the White House press corps is unlike any other creature you'll find probably on the face of the earth, but certainly unlike any other creature here in Washington. And what comes out, the kind of reporting that comes out, depending on the news organization that's, that's conveying that reporting, is a very distinct breed of, of sort of open brawl and ideological debate and gotcha reporting. What for those, and I'm sure most of you who are uh, journalists here uh, have experienced the atmosphere and the purpose, really, in the press room at the State Department is utterly different. It's um, heavily laden, laden with guidance. It's very deliberate. It's actually quite civil most of the time. Um, and it takes on an entirely different thread. The reporters who are there, and as they represent the story in their media, which you are navigating, is also uh, substantially different, uh, reflective of the twin cultures of the beat and the, and the, uh, and the news organization. We also find that, it, 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 and I reflect on the challenges that must be present for anyone because, and we have found this through direct experience, that language is different. And I don't just mean the language that we speak, but the words that we use mean different things. When the term political reform is uttered from the podium of the State Department or the White House, it's going to mean something very different. PJ, come on down and join us, and I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting my wind-up and pitch ready to introduce you. 
uh, is very, very different than, than what is meant by political reform when it's spoken uh, in the halls and, and, and in the, and the meeting rooms in Beijing or in uh, Caracas, heaven forbid. So what we'd like to do today is to really explore what it's like to navigate American media from the perspective of those who must make sense of this town and make sense of um, what the, the domestic media are reporting. For those of you who have not been journalists, I'm sorry to tell you that a disproportionate uh, amount of what is reported is built on the shoulders of those who have reported before you. So, and I have been based overseas, and I know this. The first thing that I would do every morning when I was in London was to read all the local newspapers, was to listen to BBC World, was to watch the news to see what is being reported from my region and how it's being interpreted. How are experienced journalists, how are experienced columnists and commentators digesting and explaining the latest switch in policy or the change in tone or language that the president or the secretary or the minister are using because I need to take my cues. I am, after all, a visitor. I am learning as I'm going. And I'm trying to balance what the conversations I'm having with my sources with the background noise around me and the experience of those journalists who've been covering those beats for one, five, ten, twenty years. Gee, they must be smart. They must know things that I don't know. They also have connections and sources I don't. The other very difficult thing when you're posted to another place, especially in this economic environment, is you are often the only person there, or one of very few. And you will be asked to cover by your news organization, perhaps, the flooding in the Midwest, because that's a huge story, or the latest Lindsay Lohan story, because that's a huge story to your audience back home, and by the way, the President's new development aid policy. So there's a lot of juggling, and relying on these other news organizations around you is a way of leveraging yourself. You cannot be in all places at once. I'd like to uh, introduce to you now the keynote speaker who is really uniquely capable of addressing this because he does this every day, or nearly every day, <laughs> and has for quite some time from uh, the podium uh, at the Department of State, where he is Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Public Affairs. I've known PJ for uh, a fair number of years here now, and I would tell you just as a personal matter, uh, he is a person of great integrity who understands and respects the value of information and the fact that at the end of the day, the only thing PJ has, he's got a great title, but the only thing at the end of the day he really has is his credibility. But he also knows that he spends much of his day, as do his aides, knocking down bad stories, um, dealing with people who've heard something online, a rumor in the hallway, or seen a headline in a periodical that may or may not actually be right. So, um, just so you know, PJ is not only currently Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Public Affairs, during the Clinton administration, uh, he was Special Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, uh, he was Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs before that. Uh, he has experience in the military and in the private sector and in the think tank world. So he brings a great deal of perspective and knowledge. So I'd like to introduce you to you, P.J. Crowley. P.J., we'll turn this over to you. I will come back to moderate your questions with the audience. Last time I was on the stage, um, uh, as Frank knows, um, CNN used to have a great program here called Crossfire. Uh, I was one of the uh, liberal proponents or progressive proponents on the show and uh, spent a lot of time on the stage getting yelled at by Tucker Carlson or the late uh, Robert Novak. Um, so it, it's, it's nice to be here where the audience is sedate. <laughs> now, I'm confused. I thought we were here to help, uh, you know, train uh, or, or help, uh, you know, uh, foreign journalists uh, who are maybe new to this country, country uh, adapt to covering the United States. Now, the first person I see is my friend uh, Andre Sitov, who's been here for <laughs> for as long as I have. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, you, I should be sitting listening to you talk about uh, how, to, uh, how to cover the United States. Uh, my instructions were to talk about uh, 20 minutes and then take questions. Uh, since I just got off the podium uh, at, the, at the State Department, and I, I'm not used to actually talking for longer than 90 seconds before getting interrupted by somebody, <laughs> um, uh, I'll actually you know, maybe you know, shorten uh, my opening comments a little bit uh, so we can, uh, we can you know, f find out what's on your mind, and I'll be happy to uh, you know, take those questions. I suppose, uh, you know, thinking uh, of what to talk about here, and, and I know one of the questions is, is sourcing uh, how, you know, what, what, you know, s information sources do you draw upon, uh, you know, to, uh, to cover the United States, uh, and, and perhaps part of that is relying on, on journalistic sources that made me think about the evolving nature of the news business uh, here in the United States. And, of course, on that score, I should be sitting there and have someone like, you know, Frank Cessna, who knows more about, you know, the evolution of the news business uh, in, in this country. But, um, you know, and in Frank's introduction, you know, he, he was very kind enough to say that, you know, maybe I have my credibility intact, but you didn't say I got this job because of my good looks. Uh, <laughs> um, I, yeah. Uh, I, I suppose, and you know, this is my 30th year as a government communicator. Um, it, is, it is something that I have you know, spent um, most of my adult uh, life uh, involved in, uh, starting in 1973 uh, when I was a second lieutenant uh, in the Air Force. Uh, and at that time, the United States was uh, winding down its involvement uh, in Vietnam, but there was uh, tremendous tension in the relationship between the military and government, uh, and uh, the media as an institution, um, and and for much of my uh, my career, I, I've spent a great deal of time strengthening uh, or stitching back together again uh, this relationship between government and the media, uh, because it is a, a fundamental relationship that uh, is vitally important to our democracy. Now that, that sounds very lofty, but it actually is true. And when you do travel around the country, uh, as, as we do at the State Department, we're continuously monitoring the status of news media uh, in other countries around the world uh, for a very simple reason. Now, at, at, in government, as Frank said, you know, I'll, I'll, I, I read the New York Times, the Washington Post at home, uh, before even coming to the office, and, and at the office, I get an inch thick uh, clipping package uh, that tells me what the uh, what the U.S. media have reported about uh, foreign policy, and then I get a briefing at, every day about 8:20, uh, where we have an analytical team who tells us, you know, what uh, uh, the media around the country, or around the world, uh, have communicated about. Uh, United States foreign policy or what emerging stories that might find a way from somewhere over there to, to here. Uh, so we spend a good deal of time focused on on only what journalists report, but the status of journalists in a country themselves. Um, we may have tensions uh, in our relationship between government and the media that are built in you know, to the media's role as the fourth estate uh, and to some extent as the filter through which um, government communicates uh, to its citizens and through that process we have informed citizens who can participate uh, in our democracy. Um, and and as, as sometimes you know, thorny as this relationship you know, might be, um, uh, journalists uh, do play a vitally important role in our society. Now, I, and Frank will know, you know, first of all, the American people may or may not be giving journalists today credit for this role. <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, the opinion polling is pretty, pretty you know, challenged when it comes to the public's appreciation of the role uh, of, of uh, the media in our society. A and yet it is vitally important that every day when I stand at a podium like this, uh, I, I feel genuinely that the government is standing up and being held to account to explain you know, what we did. Today it was the travel alert that we issued yesterday to American citizens who might be traveling in Europe. Why did you do that? What's the terrorist information? Why, you know, you're confusing everybody. 
um, and, and we, we should be involved in a process by which uh, we inform our citizens about what government is doing uh, on, uh, on their behalf. Now, in other countries around the world, uh, you know, journalists have uh, you know, at least the same exalted position as they do uh, in our society. But we do recognize that in various parts of the world today, journalists are being jailed, intimidated, or even killed. Uh, and, and that's where you start to appreciate that, that you know, perhaps the central challenge of, of uh, the 21st century, uh, when we consider how do we create a more peaceful and stable world, uh, is, is to expand civil society uh, around the world. Uh, and countries that are stable and peaceful are countries where there is strong accountability. And one of the institutions of accountability uh, you know, in a true democratic society is the role of journalists uh, in being able to hold uh, governments to account. Uh, if there's corruption, they report it. Uh, if, if, uh, if governments are, are serving the interest of, of uh, a narrow cross-section of the po uh, population but not the population as a whole, uh, they report it. Uh, and, and government is held to account. So we do, this is a vitally important role, and, and we, uh, that's why we at the State Department you know, spend a good deal of our time uh, you know, helping you understand us and, and helping to show here in this society you know, for, uh, for the flaws that we, we do have. Our, our democracy is by no means perfect, uh, but this is something that we think is important, and, and so while you're here, we will we, we spend a lot of time and energy and resource uh, to enable you to cover the United States, understand what's happening here, and then relay that perspective, you know, back to uh, to your citizens and to your governments. Um, so I'll be happy to to talk about that. Um, but it is it is a reflection of what I think probably the the, the most fundamental change. Uh, in the nature of our society is the expansion of, of, uh, of, of media, you know, from uh, a relatively uh, narrow uh, uh, group, you know, for, you know, think about it, you know, when I, uh, in 1973, when I first became a government communicator, you had the three broadcast networks, uh, you know, plus PBS, uh, you had a uh, you, you had a, a, a many, many newspapers, but uh, a handful that were considered, you know, the, uh, uh, the, record, the true record of what was happening uh, in this country. And, and now, 30 years later, uh, we see in journalism uh, a hemorrhage where no one's business model uh, seems to be working. Uh, and you have very good journalists who are gravitating uh, out of journalism to other pursuits. But you also have, uh, uh, we, we have less time to fairly consider uh, what, wh how, do you, how do you report, and then more importantly, how do you interpret you know, the news of the day. Uh, in our pursuit of a 24-7 you know, news environment and, and with the advent of you know, cable television and now the internet and now the blogs on the internet, you know, there are a couple of phenomenon uh, that have emerged. One is the news cycle is a lot faster than it used to be. Uh, you know, go back a few years and you had, uh, you had the New York Times might or Washington Post might report something. Uh, that would be the first, the first blush, if you will, um, uh, of, of the news of the day. Uh, television might take their cue from uh, these exalted newspapers. Uh, and then news magazines uh, you know, which would uh, print once a week, uh, would uh, perhaps provide the perspective uh, on you know what what you know were the initial facts correct or if if this happened why it happened and what should what does it mean uh, for our citizens? All that now is compressed. Uh, you have the news magazines who have moved from being weeklies to being dailies, if they still publish at all. Uh, you, you have newspapers chasing television, uh, not the other way around. Uh, and then with the advent of the blogosphere, uh, you have some convergence of you know, reporting and opinion. Uh, 
Uh, so everyone's, everyone's got an opinion, <laughs> but, but that opinion may or may not be based uh, on a credible set of facts. I think probably our greatest challenge today as a society is, is what, uh, uh, you know, what uh, news outlet can Americans faithfully go to where you have strong reporting standards uh, and uh, objective reporting to the extent that's possible. I mean, every, every news outlet has some bias. You know, at, at the extreme end now, you've got the competition between MSNBC, which is decidedly left and unapologetic about it, and Fox News that is decidedly right and unapologetic about it. Um, and then you've got journalists being, uh, uh, being interpreters uh, of, uh, of media trends, uh, you know, media, interviewing media. Uh, but I, I would just you know, simply say, you know, don't hesitate to come back to government <laughs> as a primary source of information. That's why we do uh, a daily news briefing. And inside the dynamic, inside my briefing room, is, is um, uh, it's very interesting to see the evolution of, uh, uh, of, the, of the journalists who now cover the State Department on a daily or regular basis. Uh, I have fewer American journalists in the room. Uh, a lot of uh, news organizations have cut back their, uh, their, their staffs or actually eliminated their bureaus uh, entirely. Uh, so I've got the first two or three rows are your traditional domestic press, the wires and the television networks who do cover the State Department, although they, they cover it more now with producers, not necessarily uh, an on-air talent. Uh, and then in the middle of my briefing room, I've got uh, Indian journalists, Arab journalists, or Middle Eastern journalists, and in the back of my room, the most patient uh, are, the, uh, are the Asian journalists. And so my, my briefings go through two or three or four different iterations as I start with questions from the U.S. press, then I've got this interesting dynamic where, where the Indian journalists start asking about the Middle East, the Middle Eastern journalists start asking about Pakistan, you know, and in the back, uh, my Asian journalists just want to know, what are you doing about North Korea? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, but this is, a, this is a manifestation of what has, you know, what perhaps was a U.S. media market 30 years ago and is now a true global media market today. Uh, and the challenge for us uh, is to make sure that whatever message that we are uh, communicating at the State Department uh, is echoed uh, both at the White House uh, and also at our far-flung posts around the world or, or by, uh, by a civilian communicator and military communicator uh, in a place uh, like Afghanistan because if we are communicating a contradictory uh, or confusing message, uh, and there's a disconnect between what's being said in Kabul and what's being said in Washington, uh, that disconnect will emerge within minutes, if not hours, just because of the true global nature uh, of, our, uh, of the news business and government's uh, you know, role in the, uh, in the daily reporting of international news. So we spend a great deal of time not only making sure that we as a government, as a U.S. government, are presenting a, uh, uh, a coherent message, and which is not to say that you know, we at the State Department will look at the world slightly differently than uh, my colleagues at the Pentagon, uh, and they'll look at slightly have a different vantage point than perhaps my colleagues in New York at the U.N., but it should be, broadly speaking, a consistent message that helps the Andre Sitoffs and Tosses uh, understand you know, what the government thinks and what the government uh, is doing. Uh, so this is something that we pay a great deal of attention to. Uh, everyone at the State Department understands the, uh, that uh, you know, when their uh, humble spokesman stands at the podium at 1 o'clock every day, uh, I am communicating both to my citizens uh, uh, here in the United States, but I'm also communicating the policy and perspective of the U.S. government you know, to governments overseas or to people overseas who are affected by what the United States is thinking and the United States is doing. Uh, but, you know, with that as kind of a backdrop, let me stop there and, and uh, we'll get into a conversation. I have never done this before, Frank. <laughs> <laughs>
Now, normally I would turn to a curmudgeonly, crusty reporter named Matt Lee from Associated Press, who's the dean of our uh, State Department press corps, who kind of sits right off to my left and go, okay, you get the first question. Uh, but uh, whoever wants to ask the first question. I'll kick it off this time. Aha. Um, PJ, we often talk about the echo chamber, one news organization handing off information to the next, and I think in the context of being a, um, a foreign correspondent in a, in, a, in a perplexing place, and Washington has been referred to as that place, you'll remember this, as the, you know, where, it has, where there are puzzle palaces on the Potomac. I spent 11 years there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 and it's often hard to dissect, and, and there are in fact, warring factions within an administration if you're trying to cover it, it nationally. Um, are there news organizations that people should pay no attention to in your mind? Uh, how does one determine... <laughs> I'm doing my uh, curmudgeonly thing. Line. How, how, well, how do you determine well, what, what information is, is good and, and then what role, talk a little bit more about the role of the blogosphere in propelling some of this information around? Well, when I, was, uh, when I was in the think tank world, I was, uh, the f I was Fox News's favorite liberal, which is a really interesting place to be. <laughs> um, uh, and I do, I do still appear uh, frequently on, on Fox uh, because we're normally making them unhappy in, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and I'm usually guaranteed uh, I have a very loyal following on Fox, and, and they now call the State Department, sometimes even before I'm off camera. Uh, so the last time I was on Fox, uh, because the governor of Arizona wasn't happy with something that we had uh, reported in a human rights report about the immigration law in Arizona, um, and between the, the walk from the uh, lobby of the State Department where some of the re you know, cameras are usually set up, back to my office, which is about a three-minute walk, there were seven calls, you know, complaining uh, about... Uh, the administration's, you know, criticism of the Arizona uh, immigration law. Um, I, you, you know, I, I, I um, it, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, my, my children uh, who are, who grew up in a household of news consumers, uh, I, I asked both of them a while ago, I said, so, so where do you go for your news? And the answer for both of them was Comedy Channel. Um, you know, I, I always, always think about the, the admonition when John Edwards um, announced his run for the presidency and John Stewart said, well, you know, this may not count. <laughs> um, I, I think what's it, what, it, what, is, you know, what is important is that, uh, that people need to rely on multiple sources. And, and I, I think part, part of my concern about the, the trends in the news business is that um, uh, people don't necessarily go to multiple sources. They think that, that there should just be one. Uh, and so they rely on one, uh, and then they want to make sure that that, that one network or that one paper uh, you know, fits within whatever ideological frame uh, they might have. Um, no one should rely on one source. Uh, of information, uh, because no one source of information has monopoly on the truth. Uh, I, I do, I do think that uh, the danger for us is that you you are seeing a trend towards, you know, some reporting of news, but some definite advocacy within uh, that reporting of news. Uh, the dynamic between, you know, Keith Olbermann and Bill O'Reilly, uh, and I know them both. Um, it can be fun television, but it, 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 it you know, uh, but you have there two sources of news that that are are not fair and balanced, or not objective. They they have a point of view. Uh, so so it's not that you shouldn't pay attention to what's on Oberman or O'Reilly, uh, but it, it is that don't rely on any one outlet to be your only source of news. I think. Uh, in, in we're all busy people, but we have to stop uh, and uh, pay attention. You know, read a newspaper, one or more. <laughs> you know, listen to the radio, uh, watch television, do all of those things, um, and uh, and and then 
you, you know, through that kind of digest of news, you get a strong sense of, uh, of what is actually happening, how to interpret what's happening in this country. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, my name is Josh Schreiman. I'm a graduate student here hey, at Josh. George Washington. Um, you had mentioned in your opening remarks that um, no one's business models are working anymore. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the competitive nature of the news industry today and that effect that it's had on the quality of reporting. And also, in your view, um, what are some maybe new examples of different uh, models that are, that are being introduced, um, different kinds of news organizations? One example that comes to mind is ProPublica. But yeah. different models that well, they've got are they've out got there. a lot of talented uh, yeah. people at ProPublica. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I, I you know I think that the advent of cable television and uh, and now the advent of uh, blogs uh, have put pressure on standards of reporting. Um, I, I'm we at the State Department are still trying to stug, struggle with you know how to treat bloggers. Are they, are they journalists? Are they uh, you know, offering uh, fact or opinion? And, and the answer is a little bit of both. Uh, but they, they are truly agenda setters. Uh, there's no question about that. You know, Frank, from his years at, at CNN, CNN, you know, uh, you know, starting in the mid-'80s and certainly uh, by the time of the you know, first Gulf War, had somewhat transformed how we look at uh, news. News became you know, more available to us instantaneously. Of course, now that certainly is true uh, with the Internet. Um, the concern that I have is what does that do to standards of reporting? So now you have, it used to be that from, from that, uh, and I know we, the older you get, the more you think about, well, it was always great back then. Well, it wasn't always great back then. You know, journalists in the 50s and 60s and 70s got stories wrong, and they also got stories very right. Um, but, uh, but now you, you obtain a slight wrinkle, you know, um, and then all of a sudden you're, you're on air, you know, and, and uh, you know, the government just dotted its I or crossed its T, <laughs> you know, newsflash. Um, and, and the real concern I have is, is who now provides that longer-term perspective? Uh, who, who steps back every, every you know, few days and says, okay, you know, this is what was reported, and in, you know, in hindsight, this was right, this was wrong, this was overhyped, this actually became, was more important, but we missed it. Um, now, it used to, do, used to be that news magazines did some of that, uh, now, actually, newspapers are doing a little more of that. Um, but we, we need that perspective. Uh, and and th that's, that's what's getting lost uh, in, in this compression of the, of the news cycle. Uh, and in the case of bloggers, um, and I have, I have two that are in my briefing room uh, nearly all the time, their stanzas of reporting are dramatically different. Now, but I can't afford, I can't ignore the blogger because, you know, uh, he and she, these two cases, are table setters. Uh, if, if they report something which they might have heard from a source and their temptation is, okay, put it out there and then we'll call to react to what they put out there and they'll go, okay, well, we'll, we'll add what you've said to us to, you know, to that blogging report. But... Um, it is, you know, if you're if you're constructing a blog, it is it is it's just kind of it's cumulative, you know. We we heard this, then we heard this, then we heard this, then we heard this, and if you pay attention to the blog all the time, then you know you make up your own mind was was you know this, which and it's more, sometimes frequently comes out of the category of of rumint, you know, rumor intelligence more than fact. Um, the New York Times. Has a different standard, you know. They, um, you know, I, I I got a call from a reporter the other day, not from the New York Times, but from another reputable news organization. They said, "I need a second source on this particular 
uh, issue. And I, I told them, you know, they had the, they had the fact right, but they were, they were a day ahead of, of an announcement that we planned to make last week. And I just said, you know, I'm not off the record, I'm not telling you you're wrong, but I can't be a confirming source, which then meant that they could not report the story. Uh, but but there, are, there are clear standards of journalism. Before they report something, they want it to go through a rigorous process uh, so that they are confident that what they report is as accurate, uh, accurately conveyed uh, as possible. Those are two very different approaches to news. Now, both of them can easily have a role in our, our, uh, our, our society, but, but uh, if, if, if you're only paying attention to the blogger and you don't read the New York Times, you're going to have a much different perspective on what's happening in our country. Andre. Hi, my name is Andrei Sitov. I'm uh, with TAS, the Russian news agency, which is now called ITAR-TAS, actually. Uh, first, I'm flattered that PJ, whom I do know for quite a few years, uh, actually remembers my name. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so second, uh, second, I... Uh, I once got PJ speak Russian, actually, on Russian television. I don't know if he remembers that. Uh, second, I hold uh, a government uh, accountable, only it's not my government. <laughs> I report from Washington, D.C. Uh, one, one thing I, I, I would argue with in uh, PJ's presentation uh, is uh, he says go to the source, go to the government, go to the government uh, spokesman. That's exactly what they want you to do. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah, because <laughs> hmm. uh, the, the government. So take it As from a government a, spokesman, I'm not sure I can endorse that take it philosophy. From, <laughs> take it from a former Soviet. <laughs> <laughs> The, 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 the governments have their own agendas, <laughs> not necessarily the same as the public does. Uh, in the, by way of asking a question, I, uh, I thought, uh, actually, I wanted to ask you, when, when you were telling about that guy who called for a second opinion, was, was this the story about uh, the uh, atrocities in uh, Afghanistan, the, the uh, trial in Seattle, somewhere near Seattle? No, that was a different one, okay. But that's, that, that leads me to my question. Uh, that's one, uh, one of the things that the governments do. Uh, they uh, suppress the things they don't want you to know about and uh, hype the things they do want you to know about. And uh, a good example in my book would be like this Guatemala story that somehow gets announced on a Friday afternoon. Uh, even though it then, it, it probably couldn't be suppressed. The president made a call and it, it became a big story, at least, in, at least internationally. But the State Department at one point actually tried to set up, maybe not a bureau, maybe a small organization for fighting rumors, malicious rumors, uh, disinformation. And they uh, even brought uh, the head of that uh, office to the Foreign Press Center, where we are based uh, in the same building, International Press Building. Uh, it was quite an interesting briefing. <laughs> it, it, it led to more hype around all sorts of rumors. Uh, as, as an exa you, you, you all know the kind of rumors I'm talking uh, about. The, the, at, at that point, it was that the AIDS epidemic was government-made. Uh, our days, it's probably that the 9-11 is government made or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, how do you, how do you fight rumors? Uh, you, you just referred that uh, in the current climate, uh, with the current sources, internet sources, it, it becomes even more prevalent. Uh, nobody knows what's right, what's wrong. Nobody has the time to check. Everybody is in competition with everybody else. How do you fight rumors in that uh, atmosphere? Thank you. <clears throat> it, it's a great, it, great comment and, and a great question. Um, well, I, I, you know, I, I come back to what Frank said uh, in his introduction. Um, as a government spokesman, 
the only thing that I offer, I offer information uh, and perspective, uh, but uh, I put uh, my credibility on the line uh, every single day. Um, I, you know, uh, I have this august title of assistant secretary and spokesman, but I also play reporter within my own bureaucracy. Uh, we have a we have a process through which um, every entity, you know, we, we will review the news of the day, we'll task to our policy bureaus, hey, there's, there's either, you know, stories out there or we know there are questions out there, need information on X, Y, Z, and then it gets, you know, uh, constructed, homogenized, reviewed, uh, and I get a, you know, piece of paper that goes into a binder uh, that, you know, here's the perspective on the United States of America on this issue or that issue. Uh, and, and I challenge what's on that piece of paper every single day. I said, this is not credible. This is not sufficient. You know, what, uh, what a Matt Lee or an Andre Sitoff will be asking at the, you know, at the press briefing, I need more than this. Or is this actually true? Uh, you know, do we know this is true? Uh, because if, if I convey... Uh, misinformation, then uh, I've, I've done a disservice uh, to my government, but I've also compromised uh, my role as the uh, as a as a government communicator. Um, I take that very very seriously. Now, l last week, um, one of the, one of the entities that sits within my bureau are, are the Office of the Historian. Uh, wonderful people, 44 of them. Um, we had a conference on Vietnam. Uh, you know, the secretary spoke, Henry Kissinger spoke, Richard Holbrook, John Negroponte. Um, but as we were setting up the program, uh, I said, we've got to have a media panel because the media did play uh, a, a profound role, in, particularly in the latter stages of our involvement in Vietnam. Uh, and we had a great panel uh, uh, led by uh, Marvin Kalb uh, of uh, CBS and the Shorenstein Center, uh, including uh, two uh, uh, significant journalists, uh, well, f you know, f you know, three, and, and a government spokesman from that day. Uh, but uh, Morley Safer of 60 Minutes was there, and Bill Beecher uh, from the New York Times was there. Uh, and three of them were telling all the horror stories about you know, reporting on uh, on Vietnam, and then the next thing you know, they're subject to IRS audits, and uh, two of them appeared on the Nixon, uh, you know, blacklist, and so on and so forth. And I, I was aghast. Um, now, that that was uh, my government intimidating, bullying, uh, lying to uh, the media. Uh, it's one of the sorriest episodes in our in our history where uh, Vietnam and Watergate uh, converged. Um, but part of how that ended up evolving was because, you know, government spokesmen and then the administration itself eventually lost its credibility. Uh, so, you know, uh, Andre, my, my, my suggestion would be not to, not to stop talking to the government but your role is where you believe the government is lying to you and lying to uh, your people to expose them and, and simply say, this is what the government says, and based on our own reporting, this is what we see. And where the credibility gap emerges between what the government is doing and saying and what people recognize as the reality on the ground, that's how eventually you get more effective government. It's the only, and, and that is the, you know, and, and I, there, there, I'm, you know, there were, uh, uh, but that, that's, that's where in, in the, uh, in, 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 that's where, you know, journalists played a vitally important role uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, in the context of Watergate, in, in exposing government corruption. Uh, and a conspiracy within government that led to a fundamental change in government. Now, conversely, when you, you know, think about you know the Vietnam, uh, there you know there was you know there there was clearly a credibility gap between what was being communicated about the war and what was actually happening within in the prosecution 
uh, of the war. That said, there, were, there was at least one major time, uh, for those of us who are old enough to remember the Tet Offensive, where the, where the journalists covering the war actually got that fundamental you know, battle wrong. You know, Tet was reported as a uh, defeat and you know, it certainly had a psychological impact on our country in 1968. Uh, but, uh, but Tet was a military defeat for the Viet Cong. They tried an offensive, and, and that offensive was, uh, was defeated by a combination of U.S. And, and, uh, and South Vietnamese forces. So in that particular case, it was a, it, it was, it, whether it was a turning point in terms of public support for the war, uh, you can argue. I think by '68, uh, you know, there was a clear breach between uh, what the government was doing and what the American people were willing to support. But it, narrowly in that, the, uh, the you know the reporting on the Tet Offensive where it was actually, in in, in hindsight, dead wrong. Uh, but uh, and, and that that is that's always a a risk in journalism. Is there you know there sometimes can be uh, a temptation to to, to go with uh, with a uh, inexorable trend, uh, that certainly was the case. You know, more, more, uh, more closely. Uh, you know, the the media reporting leading up to the uh, decision to invade Iraq in 2003. You know, not necessarily the finest uh, journalism in our history. Yes, I'm uh, Reggie Dale. I'm actually going to be uh, moderating the panel that follows, which I hope maybe you'll be able to stay for some of. Um, with regard to the comments by our, our uh, Russian colleague, if he doesn't pay any attention to government whatsoever, I'm not quite sure what he's doing in Washington. He <laughs> could, could, could be in, in Palm Beach. He'd be probably better off. Um, you should be in Des Moines, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the to to, to Quick questions, one very quick, one more lo logistic. Um, if there's some, on the question of credibility and, and uh, deniability and so on, if, if there's something that uh, the secretary doesn't want uh, the media to know, would, would, would she tell you and tell you not to tell them, or would she just not tell you? Uh, so, so that you could say you don't know. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't tell you. <laughs> uh, perhaps I'll go on to the second one. Then. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I, that, my, my, my first response would be something about like Rumsfelding. There, there, are, there are known unknowns, <laughs> and there are unknowns unknowns. Uh. Yeah. Um, I, I was for some years a correspondent here for a European newspaper, and... Uh, for the the the, the, te the technical problem was it was uh, it wasn't just technical, but one of the problems was that we had to produce um, reactions from the State Department before you'd actually held your briefing uh, because of the time difference. Uh, I mean, we had to be signed and sealed by eleven or uh, ten or eleven or, or, or noon, um, and of course we call the State Department, but very often not get the call back until the afternoon, because they obviously wanted to wait to hear what you were going to say. So the, the technical question is, is there some system for European correspondents, particular because of the time difference, whereby they can get a reaction out of the State Department, where, where, where you have an arrangement that people can be called back, some sort of hierarchy of time, according to their need uh, and, and their deadlines? Uh, th that's, still, that's still an issue. Uh, just to put the, you know, we brief at one o'clock um, because it takes our bureaucracy that amount of time, you know, to, to determine not only, you know, what, what the implications of a particular story relative to our policies and then what to say about it. We have tried to actually brief earlier, and and the system is struggles uh, to get um, a decent answer by. Uh, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we spend about two, two and a half hours going through a process to prepare for uh, every briefing. Uh, so there are times where, where we will miss European deadlines. Uh, that, but there, you know, that, that is, that's a, f a fair point. And we, w we try to be responsive where there is breaking news and, and the need for at least you know, some sort of early comment where we, 
uh, where we can have one. It's one that's actually one place where the, the new media, even Twitter, it's amazing how much you can say in 140 characters. You know, can, actually can be useful. It gives you at least one line, just zip it out there, and and uh, and pe journalists will uh, will pick that up. Um, in terms of of uh, what I know versus what I say, yeah, there's lots I know that I can't say. Um, the, 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 you know, I meet with the secretary every day, and and we go through uh, a few issues, and and she'll give kind of a you know strategic guidance, and then we work from that guidance uh, with others to kind of say, okay, here's where we want to be at the end of the day. Uh, and then, you know, frequently it's not me who's communicating our policy, it's she who is communicating the policy. So uh, frequently, you know, she's out before the press. Uh, she wasn't today, but she will be in succeeding days this week. So uh, we're, we're both involved in that, in that process. Uh, within the context of what we can talk about, uh, I'm committed to getting journalists as much information as possible, uh, in, say in the, in the context of, uh, say today's story, which involves you know this travel alert that we gave to American citizens, where we said you know travel to Europe, go ahead, uh, just be cautious when you're there because there are people who are actively trying to uh, attack our allies and our citizens uh, in Europe. Um, I can talk about the, that fact. I'm not going to talk about what the actual intelligence is uh, that we are working to try to defeat those people even as we speak. So there's always going to be uh, you know, some things I can say, but a as a spokesman, you know, the, the guidance, I, I need to know what the, what the story, you know, what's behind the story so I can fairly interpret it, you know, as so I can provide what I can, but not ever try to mislead anybody. I guess we could build on what the, the last question you answered was. Um, as I see it, your job is to tell the public um, what the government wants them to know about American foreign policy. Um, but there are times when the successful execution of that foreign policy depends on the public not knowing. Um, depends so on the public? Not knowing. Um, I guess a good example of that would be the delicate negotiations going on now between Israelis and Palestinians. Um, so I suppose my question is, do you view the withholding of information um, as as important a part of your job as the giving of information, and maybe you could just elaborate on that portion of your job a little more. Well, there's 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 tension here. Um, some information is classified, and there are people who do not have the appropriate security clearances uh, to be in possession of that class of information. WikiLeaks would be a perfect example of that. Um, now, I, I don't, you know, there are times where classified information will end up on the front page of the New York Times. Um, I'm not going to throw the journalist in jail, uh, you know, because, you know, the journalist is doing his or her job. It is their job to unearth information. Uh, and usually responsible news organizations, including the New York Times, uh, if they are in possession of classified information, they'll call us and say, hey, we have this information. And after allowing us to have a few expletives, they'll go, you know, now, if we print this, is there an impact? Um, and and they, will frequently, they will frequently open up where we can negotiate, uh, you know, if, if you print this, we're not happy, but, you know, uh, life will go on. But if you print this, um, then lives could be lost. Now, that sounds dire, and, and, and it is only because... Uh, of how we get information. It's usually not the information itself. Uh, it, it is that information can come from uh, people, uh, and when your sources are compromised, if, there, if there's a fact that only a handful of people in the world knew, and that fact ends up on the front page of the New York Times, and that fact came from somebody who was an aide to the president of another country, um, that person could end up you know, injured or killed. You know, so so that that is not an idle consideration. 
uh, in, in terms of our ability to gain information that gives us a perspective on the world. Uh, and that's the, largely speaking the reason why uh, you know, we have the classification system that we do. Now, do we classify more information than we should? Yes, we do. Um, uh, it, you know, that's the nature of bureaucracy. Um, now, there's, there's different kinds of information. Um, you talked about the Middle East peace process, and we are in a delicate uh, you know, period of time. Uh, there's a lot of ideas being tr exchanged uh, among the United States, the Palestinians, the Israelis. Um, you know, most everybody, probably if they sat down and, and read through various accounts in recent days, they have a pretty decent idea of, what, of the kinds of things being discussed. Here, the, the challenge is that, that, you know, given the nature of the history of, of this conflict, uh, if, you know, it, it's not that we're withholding information from people necessarily, it's because the more that is discussed publicly uh, about, uh, you know, what one leader might consider, what another leader might consider, the more public that exchange, the less likely that negotiation is going to be successful um, be, because there are groups and, and constituencies that are itching to spoil uh, a peace agreement on both sides of the equation. Uh, so uh, we, we, have tr we have committed that the exchanges that we're having with the various parties as part of this negotiation will remain uh, as private as possible. Now we've been at this for about a month you know, for the first two weeks, they did pretty well. For the last two weeks, as the, as the negotiation, you know, the tougher and tougher and tougher it goes, we've had leaks all over the place uh, in, in, the, uh, in the last few days. Um, but that, that's, that's, that's less about the actual details, it's more about the dynamic, you know, between the negotiating partners. There, there, are, there are some things that, if you're going to be successful, the less said in, in public, the better. That's just the nature of a negotiation, which is normally, uh, you know, confidential, but not classified. Okay. One last one. Go ahead. I promise this is an easier one than the ones you've been getting lately. So, um, my name is Henry Murillo. I'm an undergrad here in the School of Media and Public Affairs. Uh, my question is, earlier you mentioned that your briefings have been, uh, that you've been getting less and less journalists at your briefings in the few, uh, last few years. Uh, you said that in your opening remarks. Yeah, few, fewer and fewer U.S. journalists because I think there are fewer and fewer U.S. journalists. Okay, so, <laughs> right, my question is, as a future journalist, why do you think that you're getting less journalists? Is it only an economic um, reason on the part of the news outlets? Is it because... Um, the idea that maybe we shouldn't be going to the government for our news information, or is it because uh, maybe journalists can, can be getting information easier from other sources? And, I'm sorry, uh, okay. <laughs> um, and if they can be getting that information easier from other sources, why do you um, advocate that they should continue coming to the government for their information? Well, um, they, you know, people should seek information from the government because we uh, develop and execute policy on behalf of you. <laughs> um, and having an informed citizenry is fundamental to a democracy. Um, so you should know what we're doing. You should, you know, e you know people should be seeking information from the government uh, and, and then comparing, you know, what the government is trying to do with perhaps uh, other uh, uh, experts who might say, you know, and, and of course, and we do have that, you know, in almost everything we do now, um, healthcare, everyone's got an opinion, the economy, everyone's got an opinion, energy, everyone's got an opinion, and foreign policy, people have opinions as well. Um, and, and we are, we are, we do benefit in the case of foreign policy because we have uh, informed diaspora in this country who both can tell us, give us a perspective um, on what's happening in a particular location and they also become an interest group uh, who help us uh, in terms of, you know, I mean, we, we do operate within a political environment and, and people 
are lobbying the government all the time to do X, Y, or Z, and some of those things are re related to policies on, on immigration or, or, uh, or the economy or, or the, you know, uh, some other issue regarding a different country. Uh, so um, it's the nature of our system, uh, and it's, it's, it's how a democracy works. Um, so, you know, people, if, if, if people are not listening to the government, uh, then they're losing out on, on a perspective that helps them help us make informed decisions on behalf of the, uh, of the people. Uh, because every two years or four years, uh, you know, you vote, uh, and then in doing so, you influence the direction and policy uh, of government. That's... That, that's how a functioning democracy and civil society uh, should work. So I, I hope that people uh, do pay attention to what I say or what Robert Gibbs says or what you know, Jeff Morrell you know, says uh, at, the, at the Pentagon. And then there should be a vigorous debate. Um, uh, you know, and and, and I, I, I do get, you know, I, I ask my analysts, okay, you know, tell me, you know, Based on what I said at today's podium, or at the briefing today, I, tomorrow they'll, I'll say, you know, how did news organizations or even columnists or bloggers report on what I said? You know, and I said something on Friday regarding the Middle East peace process, and today there was a uh, an op-ed in, in an, an Arab newspaper that said Crowley is obviously uh, biased uh, you know, in favor of Israel. I am. <laughs> um, but but you know th that you know, it's helpful for me to get that kind of feedback. Uh, you know, one day not long ago, my wife calls and says the right wing is attacking you. Is there any reason why? What they are? <laughs> um, and it turned out that that you know so I, I had actually you know said something and misspoken, and then it got misinterpreted. Then it got into the blogosphere, and all of a sudden now Rush Limbaugh is you know commenting on me, which is never a good idea. <laughs> Um, so, it, it, you know, I, I want to be in, it, you know, it, to be successful, I have to be, you know, in this process by which we say something, we listen to see how it was received, uh, and, and then that, 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 adapt, that, that informs, uh, you know, what, uh, what posture we take at the podium uh, on, on subsequent days. Um, but it, 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 it's all, you know, because policy has what we call a, public diplomacy dimension to it. Uh, countries will, f you know, the United States leadership in the world is vitally important, but countries will only follow the United States' lead if they believe in those policies. To believe in those policies, governments have to understand them and their people have to, uh, uh, you know, support, you know, that uh, partnership or that alliance. Uh, it's not surprising that we, you know, one of the most vitally important relationships that we have on Earth is currently the relationship between the United States and Pakistan. But it's a very complicated relationship, not the least of which is because the approval rating in the United States in Pakistan is below 20 percent. Uh, why should a Pakistani politician support the current policy where the government is trying to build a stronger relationship with the United States? if the Pakistani people, by and large, hate us? That's a good question. Uh, so it's not that we're trying to win a popularity contest, but if we're going to have the successful prosecution of policy, then we have to have public support for that policy, whether that public support is in our country or that public support uh, is in another country with which we have an important relationship. And, and, and my ability, along with others, to communicate our policies, to build that kind of public support is an essential dimension of, of, this, of the execution of the foreign policy of the United States. On that note, thank you very much.